All right, everyone, welcome to the Energy Symposium today. Uh, aims to be a good one. There'll also be a good one next week uh, where myself, uh, Carrie King, uh, as well as Fred Beach, who also helps run the Energy Symposium, and our own uh, Dr. David Spence here at University of Texas, we will kind of have an open discussion about uh, social issues related to uh, electricity system or changes in the electricity grid and how they relate to social outcomes or why people disagree and argue one thing or another and how they seem to argue uh, past each other on different issues, say about renewables and fossil energy. So we thought we'd have one that's kind of a little bit more of an open discussion, uh, a little bit free form. Uh, so that's next week on uh, Valentine's Day. So we thought we'd have a discussion, not an argument on Valentine's Day. Uh, and today uh, we'll have a talk about California. I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Josh Rhodes introduce our speaker. Thanks, Gary. Um, and thanks everyone for, uh, for coming in. Um, so today we have uh, Dr. Michael Wara here from Stanford to talk to us about California energy policy, which is, um, which is a, kind of a big deal um, right now. Uh, energy policy is a big deal all over the U.S. Um, it's changing really fast. We've got a lot of federal policies um, that uh, don't seem to match up with each other. Uh, we have multiple state policies, um, including, you know, California is going for multiple, um, going for deep carbon-free energy. Texas is not, but still is 30% carbon-free. Um, and just today, we had the release of um, the resolution of the Green New Deal, which has um, big, big implications for energy, should it, um, should it in part or full go through. Um, and so anyone who, uh, who cares about energy or energy policy would not say that now are boring times um, in the energy space. Um, and that definitely holds true for California. So um, <clears throat> today we have, and I just dropped the bio. I have Dr. Michael War from Stanford. Um, Michael's a lawyer uh, and scholar focused on climate and energy policy. He's a senior research scholar at the Woods Institute for the Environment and the director of the Climate and Energy Program. The program provides fact-based, bipartisan, technical, and legal assistance to policymakers engaged in the development of novel climate and energy law and regulation. Michael specifically focuses on um, uh, carbon, po carbon pricing, energy innovation, and regulated um, utilities or industries. And um, collaborates a lot with uh, economic, economists and engineers in trying to, um, you know, build the, uh, the energy policy uh, that we need. So, but prior to joining the Woods Institute, um, Michael was an associate professor at Stanford Law, an associate at Holland and Knight Government Practice. He received his JD from Stanford Law and his PhD in Ocean Sciences from the University of California at Santa Cruz. And we are um, very lucky to have him today. He's recently, and he's uh, testifying tomorrow before the uh, California Senate, is that correct? No, that got that wrong? Okay. Okay. Well, he's on a Senate committee to basically, and I forgot the name of the committee, but I think it's basically to deal with the mess that is uh, PG&E and wildfires in California right now. I guess you could probably call it that. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome up Dr. Michael War. Okay. There we go. Yes. Okay. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to talk today about California and what's going on there and just maybe tell a story about how California got where it is now and, and explain where that place is. Many of you may have heard or read about in the national press how about the fires that have been happening in California, about the, the impacts on the regulated utilities in California, especially PG&E, which um, at the end of last month, filed for Chapter 11 reorganization uh, because of the impacts of fires. And I'm going to try to explain how that fits into the broader energy policy context in California, the challenges it creates for achieving California's climate and clean energy objectives um, over the next decade or so, and tell you a little bit about you know, the law, like why, why we're in the fix we're in, and what at least folks out in California are thinking about as options for getting out of the fix. Um, and then I'll hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions. So, um, you know, California is sort of famous prior to um, 
October of 2017 for this picture, right? And this is a picture of the load and net load, the demand for energy and the demand for energy minus the supply from renewables, um, especially solar. Uh, this, is, this figure is from the California Independent System Operator. And what you can see is that the load curve is the sort of bluish curve on top, and, and that really hasn't changed much. But as you add solar to the system, and we've built, um, well, actually, I was, I was quite amazed. I was looking at the solar generation uh, a couple days ago, and on like a kind of crappy winter day in California, we were producing 11 gigawatts on peak of solar. So there's a lot of new solar in the system. And that is must-take energy, given the design of the market. And so you see this trough in the middle of the day. This is 12 AM to 12 PM. Um, in March, uh, you see this trough in the load demanded from dispatchable power. And, and managing this kind of really different load shape has been a real challenge for California regulators. It's becoming a bigger challenge in other places as well. That's kind of what we talked about when we talked about California until October of 2017. And then this happened. This is a picture from the Tubbs fire, which was a fire that occurred on an extremely windy night um, in late October, um, where in about you know, one night, I mean, essentially by the time the fire trucks arrived, by the time mutual aid right, from other counties was able to reach the site of the fire, about um, five to 6,000 structures had burned down. Um, and, you know, essential, and, and, and it had burned down in ways that really people didn't understand was possible prior to the fire. Um, lots of things burned down in what we would call the WUI, right, the wildland urban interface. Um, there's lots of fancy houses up in Napa and Sonoma, up on the ridgetops that have been built over the last few decades where that burned. But there were also pretty dense urban neighborhoods that burned because the embers uh, from the fire front were being carried over a mile to two miles beyond the edge of the fire. And so they, the fire came down the hill and crossed 101 like it wasn't there. It's an eight-lane freeway um, running through the middle of Santa Rosa and then burned into urban Santa Rosa. And what was striking about this fire and a number of other fires that ignited on the same night was that so far, two of every, every one of the fires was caused by the electricity system, was caused by trees falling into the system. Some of them were caused by pg and &E lines. It turns out that this fire was not caused by a pg and &E line. It was caused by a line on the other side of the meter on a ranch, right? So the, a rancher had a power line that extended and supplied power to multiple buildings on the ranch. That's what ignited this fire. But all the other fires so far as we know, so far as has been determined to date were caused by pg and &E system um, being impacted by falling trees. And I'll just tell you, like, anecdotally, this was a very strange night. Um, you know, I live not very far from this area and woke up the next morning and my entire driveway was covered with pine needles, right? And it had just been an incredibly windy night. Everyone in my neighborhood thought the fire was where we were because the winds were so intense that the smoke blanketed us 50 miles away within a couple of hours. Um, so that became the story of California energy crisis. And, and I think there's a real question right now in California about which one is going to be the narrative moving forward. Are we going to be able to overcome the challenges associated with fire and utility cost fires? And of course, these fires were followed a month later by devastating fires in Southern California that so far as we know, we don't have a Cal Fire report yet, but everyone strongly suspects were caused by Southern California Edison's lines. And then a year later, we had the campfire that burned down Paradise in an afternoon. And the Woolsey Fire in Southern California that was, while not as devastating in terms of structures lost and certainly lives lost, was a, was a really catastrophic and, and really disruptive event for Southern California. So you sort of have two years in a row, two sets of fires, both in Northern and Southern California. The total liability from the Northern California fires is something like $30 billion, give or take. Um, so it's kind of like starting to feel like a hurricane, right? It's getting to that scale. It's not quite like the hurricanes you all have had in Texas over the, in, in the last, in the recent past. Um, the difference, though, is that it does seem as if, and certainly 
the conclusion that the markets have drawn, insurance markets, equity and debt markets, is that these kinds of fires are going to be a regular feature, absent dramatic change, of the California electricity system. And that's turned what's supposed to be a boring business. What is, Warren Buffett says electricity is a, is a uh, regulated utilities are a good business, not a great business, right? And that's why he likes them. Um, it's turned what should be a good business into something very different. And the getting out of that interesting time, I would argue, is going to be essential to delivering on the climate objectives that the state has set for itself. And it's just, before we get into the fire stuff, it's worth, it's worth noting like how ambitious California's climate objectives are. Right? California's kind of famous for what it's done to date. Famous, infamous, depending on your persuasion politically. Um, but there's a lot going on. And it is definitely a boots and suspenders approach. Um, over the next decade, what California would like to do, it's, it's, its goals, and these are goals instantiated in law, right? Not like an executive order, not an intention. These are legal requirements that the Air Resources Board, the Public Utility Commission, other regulatory bodies have to meet. Um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% from where they are now. So something like 4% per year. No one has ever done that ever anywhere, maybe with the possible exception of the, sh the fall in emissions that occurred due to the Great Recession. Hit a 60% RPS requirement by 2030. That's a sort of less talked about but more significant in terms of this discussion about what do we do now obligation that was created by SB 100, which also creates a 100% zero carbon requirement by 2045. But 2045 is kind of beyond the horizon when it comes to planning and, and, and frankly, political costs. The 60% requirement for 2030 is not. That is very much a real planning trajectory. It's in, it's, it's in the thinking that's going into IRPs. Um, it's in the thinking uh, around uh, what the community, the, the municipal utilities and community choice aggregators are doing right now. That's a real target. And it's an extremely ambitious target because it's only eligible renewables that can qualify under the RPS, right? So solar, wind, geothermal, small hydro, basically, um, and biomass. Um, there's strong support still in California for net energy metering in the rate structures. Um, there are very substantial electricity storage procurement mandates. So in California, we tend to, we're sort of like the, 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 the mirror image of New York. New York plans this incredibly intricate market that's going to totally reform how the electricity system works. That's called the REV um, program, Renewing the Energy Vision um, in New York. But they don't actually deploy a lot of stuff. In California, we create an enormous subsidy to deploy a ton of stuff, put it in the field, and then we figure out what the regulatory mechanisms and market mechanisms are to operate it. And that's kind of, that's what we're doing with storage right now. We're, we're deploying multiple gigawatts of energy storage and kind of developing in real time how we're going to operate that storage and how it's going to integrate and how it's going to make money. Um, vehicles. California is remarkably... Um, that, well, we have many policies aimed at influencing the purchase decision around light duty vehicles, and I, I should say all kinds of transportation choices, but um, we're famous for the greenhouse gas tailpipe emission standards that preceded the new EPA CAFE standards, and we're about to become infam you know, famous, infamous again as the negotiation with the Trump administration about how to modify those standards breaks down. Um, Mary Nichols, the chair of the Air Resources Board, recently made comments that suggest that those negotiations are going nowhere, which surprises no one. Um, the, we also have the zero emission vehicle program, which is something that's maybe less known, but it's basically a mandate. If you're an automaker selling cars in California, you've got to sell a certain number of zero emission vehicles every year or buy credits from someone who did. I would say you know, this program doesn't seem significant, except if you think that having Tesla in business is significant. Right? And this program is how Tesla has survived. Because they generated ZEV credits 
that they sold for hundreds of millions of dollars when they really needed the cash to get through those bad quarters, to get to the point where they're actually producing Model 3s at scale. Now, we'll see if they continue to survive. They, they have their own set of issues, and I'm not going to get into that, but the ZEP program is an important program aimed at creating innovation in vehicles. Um, and we have the low carbon fuel standard in California, which aims to reduce the carbon intensity of fuels through a kind of a market-based mechanism and is also becoming an important way that CCS, um, carbon capture and storage, and carbon capture and utilization and storage might become more real, um, more, um, more uh, economically attractive. And there's a growing effort to compel electrification of new buildings. There are a number, California's famous for its energy efficiency codes. Those were implemented at the end of the 1970s by um, uh, Art Rosenfeld and a, a set of really forward-thinking uh, regulators in California. Um, they're updated every three years on a three-year cycle. This cycle, this current three-year cycle, many of the local governments are considering things like banning new gas connections. Um, to, in new construction, so f compelling electrification um, to try to get the carbon out of the buildings. So it's ambitious. It is not a single policy. It is not, there is no silver bullet. This is a silver buckshot thing, and it's expensive, right? And it implies deployment of a lot of capital, and in particular, a lot of capital in the electricity sector. Because you could sort of summarize all that laundry list, and that's, that's not even the full list, right? I mean, the thing about California is one way you get popular as a legislator in California is you pass ambitious clean energy legislation. So the political incentives to do that are very strong. You know, we have a supermajority. It's basically a one-party state um, and supermajority Democrat, very hawkish on climate. So there are many policies, but the... The heart of the policy is this. You create a zero carbon electricity sector, or as low carbon as you can make it. You electrify everything else that you can feasibly. And then you do some mop up using some stuff, right? Maybe forestry, maybe um, changing agricultural practices to make them carbon negative. We don't totally know. That's in development. But the first two prongs rely on a healthy electricity system. So this is just a little, this is just a demonstration. This is California ISO data that just shows how the power sector performance is improving through time. Um, monthly carbon intensity of energy supplying load in California um, from 2014 through 2017. And you can see there are very large changes. And it's worth noting also that this is, these years on this chart are a five, in the middle, at the heart of a five-year drought that was kind of a millennial-scale drought in California. And I don't, have tw I don't have 2018 on that chart, but if I plotted it, it would plot far below because the drought ended. And so hydro came back into the system and replaced the gas, natural gas-fired power that it had been you know, supplementing for the normal hydro supplies that are available in California. So the thing is, if you have... So, so it, delivering on the carbon-free goal, or the low-carbon goal, cutting emissions 4% a year, whatever it is, has big implications for energy sector investment. If you're going to deploy a lot of EVs, you need to upgrade the distribution system, because you need to charge those EVs. And every EV is like half a house, right? If you're going to electrify buildings, you got to think about what I think of what the, what we, when we talk about this problem in California, we think about the Thanksgiving problem, right? You've got a cold day. Everybody's cooking dinner. If they're using an induction cooktop, they have a very large capacity demand from the system, right? And you have to be able to meet that. You have to meet peak. If they've got electric heat pumps for their house, add that in. If they've got an electric hot water heater, add that in. And that, in it, that also requires significant upgrades to the system. So the way that has worked post-energy crisis, and of course we've been, we had another energy crisis. It was partly brought to us by our own poor regulatory planning, mostly 
maybe, and maybe other things had to do with it. Um, but after the last energy crisis, you know, there was an enormous focus in California on de-risking energy procurement, right? Making sure that utilities could show to their lenders and their um, shareholders, you know, their equity, that a utility in California was a very safe investment. And that has facilitated all of the steel in the ground that we've been able to install in California over the last decade, most of which has been focused on these clean energy objectives. Um, in addition, part of the kind of success, the formula for success in California has been a very collaborative approach between the utilities and their regulators. Like PG&E, Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric are pretty atypical in their attitudes about environmental regulation, climate regulation. They tend to show up and say, sure, we'd love to do it. And um, it's going to cost a little bit more. We need to make sure that we can afford it and put it in rates. But as long as you allow us to put it in rates, we're good. That's, they're, they're, they're much less subject, partly as accident of, an accident of history. They, they really face much lower stranded cost risks than you know, the risk that an asset will become useless and that they will not be able to recover the full investment that they've made in an asset. They really don't have big stranded asset risks. And so they're game. And they're excited to play ball when it comes to these really ambitious climate programs that might make other utilities and other parts of the country very nervous. Um, that's kind of been how we get things done in California for the past decade, decade and a half. And, and the utility balance sheet, right, the healthy utility is really at the heart of that ecosystem. And around the healthy utilities have grown up many, many companies, right, the, the utility scale solar developers, for example, that build these, you know, that sign PPAs and finance the construction of large utility scale solar plants in the middle of the desert or in the Central Valley. The, the electric vehicle manufacturers that benefit from the sale of these ZEV credits. Um, a whole set of kind of service providers that, that the, the, you know, the, the solar cities and sun runs of the world where half of their business is really in California. It's less true now, but it certainly was true as they grew to be the companies that they are today. Um, all of that has been riding on high quality utility credit rating and a strong balance sheet. Because ultimately, everything is financed with a loan from the bank. And if the bank believes that the utility will pay its bills, it is willing to loan the company building something new money. And that's, that's, it, that's the basic equation for how you get technologies built, especially technologies that are risky, right? that are new, that, that have what financial people would call technology risk. So energy storage is a great example right now. Solar is still has significant technology risk, especially in California because of that duck curve. We know how to build a solar power plant, but we don't know what the market will look like as that duck, as the belly of that duck gets close to zero, right? as, the, as the solar erodes its own value because there's so much of it around at certain times of day, at certain times of year that it's being curtailed or, or sold uh, for a negative price, lots of things. Um, so fires challenge all of that because they have destroyed the health of the utility balance sheets in California. PG&E's first and foremost, but also Edison's. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, the challenge from wildfire in California, this is a picture of Sausalito, which is a place right near my, where I live. It's very picturesque. Recommend visiting if you're ever in San Francisco. Um, but you can see all these houses, and I'll just tell you that each one of those houses is probably worth you know, $3 million. And they have zero defensible space. Right? You can see all the trees that are growing around them. And um, they're on a steep wooded slope. Right? So it's kind of prime high-risk wildfire territory. Um, we have a heavily forested landscape, especially in Northern California. The, the ecology of the landscape is fire-dependent. 
a lot of the trees are designed to burn, right? They, they reproduce by burning. Um, and it's a natural part of the ecology of California, fire. And the reality is that especially, um, I mean, the, after, the, after the Yellowstone fire in the 90s, um, the National Forest Service got gradually a bit more innovative in how they approach fire in the landscape. And they began to put fire back into the landscape. And that's important in certain parts of California. But Cal Fire, the agency that actually has to put the fire out where people live, they are living like it's 1950. Right? They want to put the fire out by 5 p.m. And they do not believe, and they, are, they have not believed in really until this year, and they're in the process of reevaluating this position, but they have not believed in the use of fire in, um, in the landscape as a sort of important strategy for reducing long-term risk. And so there's a lot of kind of accumulated vegetation. Um, this place, Saucedo, used to be a ranch. Right? When these homes were built, there were no trees because it was, a ran it was ranch land. The cattle were raised there to feed people living in San Francisco. The wood was cut down to burn in fireplaces in San Francisco. And so the homes were built, and the forest has regrown. So this is another, another factor in the kind of fire challenge in California, especially in the areas around the urban cores, is that the homes were built when there was no forest, but now there is. It's been 70, 80 years. And the forest has grown back, and we've suppressed fire. So we have a real challenge. Layered on top of that is climate change. Um, in California, we went through a, recently went through a five-year drought that we know from tree rings is basically unprecedented in the historic, in the archaeo or I don't know what you call it, the dendrochronological dendrochronological history. Um, and we have a long history in California because we've got some very old, long-lived trees in California. Um, we also have a much longer fire season than we used to. And this really has to do with the delay of the, in California, it doesn't rain from April 1st to October 1st. And that's generally, the end of that period is generally the end of the, is the most intense part of the fire season because the fuels have had the entire summer to dry out. Um, more recently, you know, over this, this time period, it had that the end of that dry season, the beginning of the wet season in California has been delayed longer and longer into the fall. And so now, you know, in many years, it doesn't really start raining until mid-November, sometimes early December in California. And so that results in much drier fuel and low, and, and then when these fires occur, you combine dry fuel with very low relative humidity in the late season and you have kind of a perfect combination of um, elements to feed a, a conflagration like the ones we've seen. Um, you layer on top of this what people have done in terms of where they live, uh, and it makes the problem even worse. Um, and there are market dynamics in, the, in, in development in California that strongly favor building in the wildland urban interface. There are about four and a half million homes in high fire risk areas, according to the U.S. insurance industry. Two million of them are in California. Okay, so it's a, California is a big part of the problem. Texas is number two with 700,000. Um, land use policies in California have largely not taken fire risk into account. Um, the, in many places, the fire departments have to approve new, new development, um, but they're kind of cowed, <laughs> is what I would, how I would put it. Um, they don't tend; they they almost never reject new proposals, and they do they they will condition them on modest modifications to increase the ability to evacuate an area and get fire trucks in. That's been an important lesson that you need a one way in and one way out during one of these fires. Um, but like I said, there are many, there are millions of homes at risk, and that complicates the problem, kind of in the way that South Florida is complicated from a hurricane risk perspective. We know that the homes there are at a significant risk because they're at sea level and they face the possibility of a very powerful storm making landfall. But the idea that you're going to ask South Florida to move is a non-starter. The idea that you're going to ask two million 
homeowners in California to abandon their properties, even though they have been built in what is turning out to be a kind of an irresponsible place, is a non-starter. Um, and because of the real estate markets in California, the value at risk is just massive. Um, the highest concentrations of homes in the riskiest category, tier three wildfire areas, basically are in LA County, surrounding the densely populated parts of Los Angeles, you know, where the Woolsey fire was this December, and in the hills surrounding the Inner Bay area. So that is, from an insurance perspective, a pretty scary reality. Um, so how big of this, now, fires start for all kinds of reasons. You may have seen, there's, there's, if you haven't seen it, go check it out online if you're interested. There was a, a fire called the Car Fire that burned in Redding um, back in July, where there was an EF3 fire tornado that was generated by the fire and burned into a part of Redding. Um, so that fire was started by a flat tire sparking on a road that threw sparks into dry grass on a windy day. How big of a problem is electricity in this picture? Um, I would argue that the data suggests that electricity is a very big part of the problem. This is data that just shows for the 21 most destructive fires in California um, over the period from the 1920s to present, so a very long period, um, where most of the structure loss is coming from. And everything in blue was caused by vegetation falling on electricity wires or putting conductors on the ground. That's a lot of structure loss associated with electricity. Other human causes are also important. You know, they're a fifth of the problem, but electricity is a big part of the problem. And I would note that this light blue, the 17% in dark blue, are fires that basically occurred prior to 2017. That light blue is the last two years. So we've crossed some threshold where, for a combination of reasons, the electricity system has become much more risky to operate in California. And this is, you know, you can look at it in lots of different ways. Deaths due to wildfires by cause, about a little less than three quarters are coming from the electricity system. Um, it's a little bit better when you think about acres, acreage, because there are large wildfires that burn where nobody lives. Um, the, the Rim Fire in Yosemite was one of, one of these fires, 250,000 acre wildfire, where basically no one lives. Um, I just note one other thing about these fires. You can see that this is the list of the 21 fires I just mentioned. And just look at the timing of this. 1923, city of Berkeley. Bad day to live in Berkeley. I'll show you a picture of that at the end of the talk. 61, 90, 91, 92, 99. But look at the concentration of fires over the last three years, four years. It's really, we seem to have entered a different environment in terms of the fire, um, and forest ecosystems in California. Maybe this is because the ecosystems are in transition. There are certainly a lot of dead trees in the environment due to that five-year drought. Um, maybe it's some other reason. But we are living in a different fire ecology than we did 20 years ago. And as a result of that, the electricity system is sparking fires and sparking them on days when they're, diff they're essentially impossible to manage. There's a correlation between when vegetation is going to hit a conductor and knock it on the ground and when the fire that ignites from that initial cause is going to be essentially unstoppable. Um, so that wouldn't matter if California didn't have kind of an unusual method for allocating risk and liability for utility-caused wildfires. I just want to talk about some first principles, and then we're going to talk about the reality. Um, I would argue one first principle to think about in this context is that electricity is an essential good, right? We, um, and, and everyone needs electricity to live in a modern world. Um, another important um, principle is in risk management generally, to allocate risk to those who can most efficiently manage it um, or bear it. 
right? So you want to give the risk. This is what lawyers do, essentially, right? Is we, when we write contracts, the value we create is risk allocation. And um, I, in an ideal system, you're going to allocate the liability for a problem to the parties that can most efficiently manage it, bear it, and maybe make it smaller, right? So you might want to think about risk allocation in terms of who can, who can manage a risk, who's big enough, who has enough ballast to take on something, and in addition, the incentives that are created by risk allocation. Um, another principle is that utilities have an obligation to provide energy to all customers in their service territory. Right? They have to provide a service connection. That's, what they, that's, what, that's one of the key obligations that utilities have in exchange for their monopoly service territory, in exchange for the exemption from competition and antitrust law that they're granted under pretty much every utility system um, in existence. So what do we actually have in California? Something very different. Uh, in California, uh, through a doctrine called inverse condemnation, uh, utilities that cause wildfires are strictly liable for all damages that flow from the ignition. And this this comes out of the state constitution. Many state constitutions have kind of similar language, but I just want to mention it because most people don't read the takings clause in their state constitution. They're familiar with the Fifth Amendment that says you can't take property without just compensation. Many states have that. Many states have a modification of that that says you can't take or damage property. And that or damage has been interpreted to mean that when you give eminent domain power to an entity, usually a local government, right? But also maybe a railroad or an electric utility or a gas utility, right? Someone building a network infrastructure. When you give them eminent domain power, they have to compensate anyone they take property from. That's the familiar part of the Fifth Amendment takings doctrine. But under many state laws, they also have to compensate anyone whose property they damage through the normal operation and use of the system that's created via eminent domain. So imagine a, I mean, the, the, a, a public entity building a road. And by building a road, they change the stability of a slope. And there's a landslide that damages a, neighbor, a neighboring property. The public entity is liable for those damages. This has long apl been applied to local governments. Um, it's applied to local governments in many states. In California, uniquely, it has been extended to investor-owned utilities by a decision called the Barham case and that, was just, that was handed down in 97 and basically involved a small fire, right? $200,000 or so caused by Southern California Edison. They, they set the utility line set a fire and the appellate court looked at the situation and said, you know, if this were a public utility, inverse condemnation would apply. What's the difference between an investor-owned and a publicly-owned utility? Not that much. They have eminent domain power. Yeah, there are shareholders, but we all know that they're going to be able to socialize any damages that occur in rates, right? They'll just, ex they'll just include this as an expense in rates. And so we should apply, we should extend the doctrine of inverse condemnation to these investor-owned utilities because they basically look the same as public utilities, which there are many of in California, right? We have SMUD, Sacramento Municipal, and LA um, Department of Water and Power, two very large municipal utilities in California. Um, and this decision to extend liability has been supported by multiple subsequent decisions in court. Um, now, you, it's worth remembering that that's no big deal as long as the utility can pass the cost through in its rates that it charges customers. But that second step was called into question actually by a decision by the California Public Utility Commission that was handed down literally like the ground was not cold in Santa Rosa from the, from the Tubbs fire when this decision was finalized. Um, in general, utilities can recover expenses that are prudently incurred. Right? So they can apply if they pay an employee 
they can charge their ratepayers for the cost of paying that employee. If the car, if the utility truck breaks down and it needs a new transmission, they can pay, they can charge customers for the cost of that transmission um, if, if, if they count that as an operating expense. If they lose a lawsuit, they can generally charge customers for the cost, any damages they have to pay in that lawsuit, as long as they were prudent in carrying out their business. Um, everybody always thought about inverse condemnation that uh, it would sort of work like that, right? The, the damages were small, it wasn't a lot of money, it wasn't going to make a lot of noise in rates, right? And so the utilities would be allowed to socialize the costs through their rate structure. There was a big fire in San Diego in 2007 called the Witch Fire. And it was kind of the first really big utility cost fire. $2 billion loss, $2.1 billion. Um, ultimately, San Diego was able to shove some of those losses onto um, Cox Communications, the fiber that was wired, that was underneath the, the wires, the electricity wires, was a partial cause of the fire. And they were able to settle the lawsuits on favorable terms to San Diego Gas and Electric. And they went to the commission with a $400 million inverse condemnation expense. And the commission denied recovery. And they denied it because they looked at San Diego's, this is the, really the first time, they looked at San Diego's operational behavior during the fire. And they found that that was imprudent. That San Diego should have known that their wires were arcing. Actually, they did know, and they didn't de-energize the wires fast enough. They, they should have done a, taken a variety of actions that they failed to take, and therefore they denied cost recovery. Um, this decision is kind of a key pivot point in what went wrong in California. Not to say the decision was wrong, but everything that has followed from the, from the, in the California experience really emanates at this point as well, because it creates uncertainty about whether the utilities will be able to recover costs from these gigantic wildfires that appear to be um, a more and more common experience in California. So um, after the 2017 fires, the, Nap the Napa Sonoma fire and the first of the Southern California fires called the Thomas fire, um, it, it became apparent that you know, another, well, let me, let me back up and say, another way we manage risk is we buy insurance, right? We all probably buy insurance of one sort or another or get insurance for our employers, for our health. Um, one logical response to these problems that the utilities are having is, well, they just need to buy more insurance. That would solve the problem. The only thing is that the insurance industry is pretty smart when it comes to risk. And they saw this problem coming leading into the 2017 fires PG&E was carrying $800 million worth of insurance for the 2017 fire season, sort of general liability coverage. It cost them $240 million to get that insurance. So if you think about that math, there's, what that, the insurance companies are saying is there's a one in three chance we're going to pay, right? Um, and that was all the insurance they could buy. They probably, we don't quite, the, it hasn't all been worked out. And as I said, the Tubbs fire was caused by someone's private equipment. So you can't recover from PG&E for that. But something like, um, you know, the, the loss, the total loss in those fires would be $15 billion. So if you think about trying to insure that amount of, of risk, or even a fraction, a substantial fraction of that risk, where you're paying one third the coverage, you're looking at multiple billion dollars of expenditure on general liability coverage, I'll just tell you that PG&E recovers in rates for everything, gas and electricity, $6 billion a year, right? So this is not going to work. You're not going to be able to insure your way out of this problem um, without doubling rates, essentially. Um, the 2017 fires also did um, enormous damage to the utilities' financial positions in a, in a variety of ways, right? Their equity was severely impaired, um, both PG&E's and Edison's. And that matters, not so much because you care about shareholders. I mean, you might if you own one of these stocks, but, but it matters because, utility, because of the way utilities invest, right? They essentially buy steel in the ground 
with a mix of new equity and new debt, and they pay their operating expenses, including the return on capital, out of rates. So if utilities can't sell stock or they can't issue debt, they can't put steel in the ground, right? That's the challenge. Um, but after 2017, I think everybody was wondering, is this an outlier? Was this an outlier? There had been a fire in Oakland Hills in the early 90s called the Tunnel Fire that was devastating. But it was a once in a generation event, right? And maybe tw the 2017 season was one of those things, a once in a generation event. In addition, there were uncertainties as to cause. We didn't totally know if PG&E was going to be responsible or not. Um, Nevertheless, there was a significant legislative response to these fires in 2019. And in particular, California passed bipartisan wildfire legislation, which like bipartisan legislation is a unicorn in the California legislature. I mean, it doesn't happen very often. But it did here. There was real collaboration and significant amounts of money, $200 million a year, were um, appropriated from greenhouse gas cap and trade money uh, for creating better defensible space, more vegetation management, right? Um, there was a structure created to pay off wildfire expenses from 2017 over a long period of time to securitize those expenses and rates rather than recover them over one rate case cycle. Um, and there were potential limits put placed on the magnitude of utility disallowance from wildfire. So the, the amount of money that shareholders, as opposed to ratepayers, might have to bear from wildfire losses. With an eye on keeping the utilities solvent and healthy um, so that ratepayers wouldn't suffer, right? At some point, making shareholders pay for an expense like this is kind of cutting off your nose to spite your face uh, because if the utility goes out of business or, or gets into junk bonds, gets a junk bond credit rating, the ratepayers will pay for that as well. They'll just pay through a different mechanism. Um, and there were lots of other bills. Yes? Yes. So the great, thank you, Ross. Thanks for asking that. So the, the connection is, is as follows. Um, if they go bankrupt, the experience in California has been that we still need a company to supply um, grid-supplied energy to customers. And so what we ended up having to do was to um, pay a very high cost of capital post-bankruptcy, as high as 20%, right? So like basically putting the electricity system on a credit card um, for many years post-bankruptcy. And so there are financial distress costs that ratepayers do pay for. You're absolutely right that in a bankruptcy, in a reorganization, you're going to write down the existing debts. The tricky thing, though, is, you know, what is it? Once burned, twice shy, right? The financial markets remember. And they, pay, they make you pay if you burn them. And that's what California had already done. So there was a lot of concern about that. And that's the primary concern motivating that stress test idea. It was very controversial, however. And in particular, um, rape hair advocates were opposed to it and the plaintiff's attorneys for the wildfire victims. Um, so <laughs> we had just gotten done with the legislative session in 2018. September 1 of 2018, all these bills got signed into law by government. A couple months later, the Paradise Fire happened and the Woolsey Fire in quick succession in Northern and Southern California. Um, and after that, there's a fundamental loss of trust in California um, in the investor-owned utilities. At the same time, you know, that, that's on the part of California citizens, regulators, legislators. The other people that lost trust in the California investor-owned utilities were the markets. After the campfire, PG&E was essentially cut off from the debt market and the commercial paper market. So they could no longer finance anything. And at that point, it was kind of a matter of time before they went bankrupt. SCE, Southern California Edison, was cut to 
something getting very close to a non-investment grade status, and they're on credit, they're on, um, they're being considered for downgrade as we speak. And basically what the ratings agencies have said is, we're looking to see what California does. This environment is not a utility environment anymore. It's not a widows and orphans situation. It's a two and 20 kind of situation, right? It's, it's, and that's, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, so two and 20, that's how hedge funds get compensated or hedge fund employees. Um, and the, the, um, the reality is that everybody who used to own California utility stocks and bonds sold them. The low risk investors sold them to a group of people that need to make a lot of money because they're willing to take large risks and they expect to get paid a lot of money, 20% um, or something. And that's kind of the challenge uh, that California faces right now. This is just this very bizarre picture of the, the llamas on the beach in Malibu during the Woolsey fire. All the animals were evacuated to the beach as the fire burned to the coast. So that's like Zuma Beach, um, which is a great beach if you've never been there. Um, so the, there's sort of two dimensions to this problem. One is solving the financial problems created by the existing utility liabilities, right? What about those 2017 and 2018 liabilities? What's the workout, right? But arguably more important is how do we de-risk the whole situation, right? It's one thing to fix the liabilities, but you can't bring the company PG&E out of bankruptcy unless you can create a plan for how it's not going to end up right back there in a year or two years' time with another big fire. So right now, I, I would say problem number one is tractable, right? Lots of people know how to do a workout with a reorganizing in a reorganization situation. There's plenty of people who know how to do that. Problem number two is much harder, and that's what I'm going to just talk briefly about for the rest of this. So this is when I live there. That's 1929 in my town. Um, the solving the go-forward problem, the problem of future risk of fires, is critical. It's critical to affordability. It's critical to um, achieving climate goals. And um, it's critical to avoiding increases in rates that will lead to load defection in California. California has the highest rates already in the lower 48. That works in California because we have low bills, right? So we have very efficient built environment building envelopes. And so the bills Californians pay are actually among the lowest in the country, but the electricity rate is among the highest. If electricity gets a lot higher, you tend to run out of um, space in rates because people will install solar and batteries. So one option to solving the problem is insurance. In particular, in the southeastern states, there are catastrophic wind insurance programs that have been a, done a decent job of managing a similar kind of catastrophe risk that seems uninsurable. Um, but the key questions with this, this approach are, how often are the fires going to happen? How much money will this take? What happens if the coverage is inadequate? And how does it alter incentives? Um, like if, if you tell the utilities, that they're not going to be liable beyond a billion dollars in a given fire season. Will they behave like we want them to? Um, another option is traditional grid hardening, right? Steel poles, insulated wires, um, undergrounding in some places, super expensive stuff. Um, key questions with this approach are how long is it going to take? PG&E said in its general rate case in, in November that they thought they could get grid hardening done in about 10 years. So, okay, how many fires will there be in the next 10 years while they're doing this grid hardening? And can they actually get it done in 10 years? In particular, can they do it if they have really bad credit? Can they finance the level of investment that they would need to do the grid hardening, given the situation that they're in now and that they will be in if and when they emerge from bankruptcy? Um, and will it deliver the level of safety that California wants, right? Can you actually provide perfection, which is, I think, where Californians are getting close to demanding. Maybe unrealistic, given where they've chosen to live. Um, the third option, which is maybe the most interesting one, is just turning off the power. And this is becoming a very real conversation in California. 
shutting off the power when there are dangerous conditions. Um, in addition, perhaps investing heavily in mitigation, in mitigating the impacts of safety power shutoffs, right? So backup power, backup generation, on-site generation in high-risk areas. It's a novel approach to customer reliability, right? It's essentially giving up on obligation to serve in what could be, you know, several days a month, a week a month during fire season in some parts of California. Key questions are how do you pay for it? Um, can you actually mitigate the impacts? And how does that affect grid economics when the power is turned on? So um, how do we solve it? One thing that California is doing is a wildfire commission. I'm on that commission with a bunch of other smarter people. Um, and we're charged with making recommendations about what to do. Um, in addition, the utilities are kind of doing things already. And they're, what they're doing is essentially a mix of the grid hardening proposal and the power shutoff proposal, sort of a hybrid. But all of this is happening, and the 2019 wildfire season is about to start in, you know, maybe four or five months. So I just end with one comment. Um, well, two. One is, if you don't solve this problem, California doesn't achieve its climate goals, period. I think that's a fair statement. And anybody who tells you different isn't, maybe hasn't faced up to the hard truths of what those climate goals are going to cost. Um, and the other is just to note that um, there are kind of two big lessons from California energy policy is of the mistakes of the past. One is don't let utilities go bankrupt. Ask Governor Gray Davis how that worked out. Uh, the other is beware the unintended consequences of big changes to complex regulated markets, right? We made a big, rapid change in the late 90s, and that got us into a world of trouble. Sorry I went long. Happy to take questions. All right, any questions? I see we have one. Ross. Hi, Michael. <laughs> I'd like to abstract from the specifics of fires for a moment. And um, somehow, historically, utilities were basically insulated from bad outcomes, right? If a fire occurred in 1923, had that been due to PG&E, I don't think you could argue that they would have ever been charged. And I'm very intrigued to have learned about this 97 legislation and so forth. But I want to go a bit more general than that. Do you think this is a harbinger of utilities more generally in the U.S. being less insulated from bad outcomes? And, and I'm specifically not thinking of fire here. I'm thinking of uh, Southern Company with, nu with its nuclear debacle and Southern Company with its uh, Kemper. Uh, uh, right. I, I just, so, they, so they've got a, you know, a, a daily double, right? I don't know what the trifecta is. But do you see this as a starting point where uh, the criterion used to be you had to be absolutely malicious to, be, to, to get to suffer. Near, now it could be you, you, you merely have to be incompetent to suffer uh, from, from, from bad outcomes. I think that I would say no. And the reason is that this is a different kind of problem in that it is recurring, right? Essentially, you could think about what happened in California over the last two years as PG&E throwing away two finished pow nuclear power plants, right? And just deciding to scrap them and then working out a disallowance. And that, you know, that could be even be manageable in a state the size of California if it wasn't going to happen again. But the problem with what's going on in California, I think this may be a, this may be a problem that's, that's a larger problem in the West. There, you know, Colorado is very exposed to wildfire risks. Oregon and Washington are very exposed. You could see you know, kind of multiple large losses associated with utility infrastructure um, in those states driving something like this. Um, but we haven't seen it yet, and I think that, you know, I don't know enough to say whether the data on fire, you know, ignitions from electricity infrastructure would support that hypothesis. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, 
My question is essentially about veg vegetation management. Does California have specific requirements about uh, vegetation management on lines as far as like a right of way width um, sure. to height or you know overall hazard tree because you know some areas you can have a, a normal in most parts of the country right of way width but California has particularly tall trees in some areas um, and you know are there any examinations going on about as the utility forest thickens and grows up in these areas the correlation between the wildness of the utility forest and the increased need for vegetation management. So California does have safety related vegetation management standards for electricity um, lines, just like I think pretty much every other state. Um, the tricky part about that relates to trees that are outside of the easement. So in these high wind events, right, what's happening is that a tree that's 50 feet away from the power line, way outside of what is pruned by the utility arborist, loses a branch that hits a conductor and knocks a pole or knocks a pole over. And those trees are actually the 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 utilities are obligated to remove trees that are dead, dying, or decadent um, that might fall into lines, but not if they have to trespass to do so. So a lot of times, if you're on a if you're on a big piece of property in a more rural area, you know, the, the utility arborist will walk the line and look both ways as they go and they'll, they'll go out and trim, you know, out to the, the, a distance that's equal to the height of the trees um, to, to make the line safe if they see something that looks risky. But in the dense urban environments where all the distribution circuits are, that can be very hard to do because you encounter, you know, someone in Northern California, where I come from, that's, you know, affluent, entitled, thinks that they move to the town that they live in because they love, they love how it looks and they don't want PG&E to come trespass on their land to cut down a, you know, 100 year old oak tree. And so it can prove very challenging to create the kind of defensible space around the lines that you would like, even with the best intentions. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that I thought this was a really interesting presentation because I'm actually from Ventura, California. Um, my home burned down in the 2017 Thomas fire. Um, so this was definitely very pertinent uh, to my experience. But having lived in Ventura my entire life, having never really experienced anything of this magnitude, having been through that five-year drought, I was just wondering... Um, it's not a very technical question, but I was just wondering how f frequently fires or uh, instances of just fires being started, even if they're very small because of electrical issues, occurs and why nothing seemed to be prepared in the, wi uh, in the midst of this drought to uh, alleviate something as crazy as the Thomas Fire and Woolsey Fire? I, this may be a stupid question, but I'm a student. No, I'm I mean, I, so. think, I think that's a good question to ask, and it's why Geisha Williams lost her job, right? The CEO of pg and &E was um, replaced um, recently. And um, the, I, I would argue that it is a failure of enterprise risk management, right? The fundamental responsibility of the CEO is to look at the risks the company faced, faces that are company-killing risks. And the utilities, with the exception of San Diego, who after the 2007 fires looked at the situation and said, we have to operate our system in the risky areas in a totally different way. And they did that. They went in and they installed weather stations on their poles. They, uh, they, do, they designed, they re-architected their grid so that they could turn off sections of it more easily and impact fewer customers. And they turn off the power when the wind is blowing in the eastern part of San Diego at this point. And they've done that for the better part of six years. Um, and the other two investor-owned utilities essentially looked at the situation and said, well, that's San Diego. That's, that's something that happens down there. It's not relevant to us. And I think that's a failure of, of vision um, that's had tragic consequences. Two questions. Thank you for being here. Um, the first one is on the counterfactual of other states that don't have the strict liability, what are the, what have you observed as far as their behavior patterns? And secondly, as far as the turn off power, since there's a, such a strong ZEV mandate with electric vehicles, what about vehicle to home, not vehicle to grid? Uh, 
So for a microgrid application, so somebody has PV in their house, they use the battery in their home, the island off the grid, and they could use that just for a microgrid, and they don't have all the burden of coordinating with the grid. It's just vehicle to home. Yes. Um, so the, the vehicle to home idea would currently void the battery warranty. And so you would have to work with the auto manufacturers to, to make that happen. I think there's not a reason why it couldn't happen. Um, in general, um, you know, the big DER companies that operate in California look at this problem and they see dollar signs, right? I mean, they, they, this is a, if there was ever an argument to put a battery in your house, this is it. And if there was ever an argument for the state to subsidize batteries, because of their locational value, man, this locational value makes any kind of like, you know, congestion management problem in a load pocket look like, like pennies. And this is the this is the pot of gold. So, that's a conversation that's happening in California. I forgot your first question though. Um, from others. Oh yes, yes. So, my sense is that, well, first of all, we haven't had. Util so far as we know, we haven't had utility cost fires of this magnitude in other states. This may be a unique. Okay. I stand corrected. Um, the in general, the the kind of financial market consequences of um, well, let me, let me in other states when you look at the issue of wildfire and how utilities manage wildfire, what they are mostly focused on is replacing their system when it burns down. And they are not focused on preventing utility ignition. So that indicates that either the liability regime, which is a negligence regime in other states, essentially, is allocates risk in a way that, that insulates the utilities or leads them to take actions that are enough to protect themselves. Um, I think in California at this point, even if you had a negligence regime, you'd have the utilities losing in court on a negligence claim, right? I mean, they, they, there's so little trust. And there's this example of what San Diego has done and it, to avoid the risk that creates a different standard of care. And that's very significant in, a, in that kind of a, in a tort context. Yes, precisely. So I think you said there were uh, 2 million homes that were at risk. And using a, a conservative California estimate of a million dollars a home, that's $2 trillion worth of homes at risk. Um, has there been any reduction in the, um, if I did my math right anyways, has there been any reduction in, the, um, in home values since, um, since, since all these fires have been, uh, um, have been lit and moving out? No. Um, I mean, it's hard to know what the counterfactual would be. The thing that is happening, though, is it's getting harder to get insurance, okay. right? So homeowners insurance, there are, it's California, so there's, everything is pretty heavily regulated. Home, home insurance is not allowed to increase very quickly by law in California. So the insurers can't price the risk, and so instead they are using, they're, they're not writing policies in the risk areas. They're essentially managing their risk by, by reducing their exposure. Um, they want to stay in the California market because there's trillions of dollars worth of real estate to insure. But they're pulling back from these risky markets. And they're being, and that's important because you can't have a mortgage if you don't have homeowner's insurance. Um, so that's another problem that's going to play out over the next several years, most likely. Somewhat related to that, thanks for bringing up the, the land use question. And I mean, especially in Northern California, the cities have been pretty notorious about not wanting any more density or growth or multifamily. Have you seen any change in that discussion or mentality in the last year and a half since these bigger fires, to the extent that they are exacerbating, pushing people into, um, what do you call it? The not Wildland the urban interface, the WUI. The WUI. Yeah. Um, are you seeing that at all? And then again, on the insurance side, do you think that will help push for more um, housing in already developed areas rather than into the Sierra or the Redwoods? Well, you know, in rebuilding, in particular, Sonoma County and Santa Rosa has really made a push to try to build density in downtown. 
Um, the challenge with that is that it's so expensive to build anything in California that the econ and, and because that part of California is very much an earthquake country, building tall buildings is expensive. And it actually, even at the price you get for a condo in downtown Santa Rosa, it's, not, it's tough to make the economics pencil. Um, so the, there, are certainly, there are certainly a lot of conversation about that and desire to connect efforts to you know, essentially take back some local control, right? Take back the authority to build in certain places and forbid building in other places and kind of integrate that into a larger whole. Um, the folks that are most pro uh, what we call yimbies, yes in my backyard types in California, are making an effort to connect not building in these risky areas with building where we should build for lots of other reasons or people they would like to see greater ability to construct new housing. My name is Dave Miller and Mr. Waro, with all due respect, you are the problem. And what I mean is, very intelligent, well-educated lawyers and a legal system that spins interesting new theories and allocates risk in a way that is simply unpredictable. And I notice that lawyers protect themselves from these risks. Nobody is forcing lawyers to invest in the sorts of things that you're asking other people to invest in. And so you've created an environment, and I don't mean you personally or the legal profession, it's the nature of California. I've spent time there, it's a lovely place. Uh, and so we have this set of very important technical questions and risk allocation questions, and you're saying things like, everybody always thought. No, lawyers did, the engineers never thought this. So you have this set of technical questions that are trying to be resolved now by allocating the cost to somebody else. And in the end, the somebody else's are going to say, well, why should we operate in this environment which is very much like China or Russia from a regulatory point of view? And I don't mean that in a bad way. So how come you not talked about the responsibility of the legal profession and the court system that generated these sets of problems? Well, let's see. I'm going to th think about how to respond to that. I think it is definitely the case that... Um, a broad, you know, and, and, I, and I, I, I tried to sketch this out in the presentation and describe how there are a broad set of factors that have led to this outcome in California. Really bad land use planning, right? Which is the function of the court system. Like, let's be clear, right? The reason that land use development happens in California the way that it does has to do with lots of local zoning and politics, also the California Environmental Quality Act, which a lot of people who want to build things in California absolutely hate. Um, and that's lawyers. You're right. It's also, though, a product of a political system that has favored certain choices over others. And, um, and, and it also may be, and I think it is the case, that it's uh, what we have right now in California is a function, is a, also represents a failure of imagination on the part of the investor owned utilities. Um, and that's Maybe they're too lawyered up. You could make that argument. Maybe PG&E is too lawyered up. The, the management is too insulated from the rest of the company by its lawyers. People. Okay, so you're asking a question about, I'm sorry, inverse condemnation. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just say um, it, it's the courts about you know, extending a doctrine that is a long-standing doctrine that's applied to local governments in many states to a new context. And I agree. I think that the, the context has changed in which it's being applied. It's one thing to socialize a risk um, that's a, a $200,000 risk. It's another thing to socialize a risk that's a $20 billion risk or liability. And 
you may need to think differently. I think you do need to think differently because the facts matter. And the physical risk environment in which a particular liability regime has to operate will determine to some degree whether it works for society or not. And I would argue that what we're experiencing in California is a changing physical risk environment and that has gradually evolved over the last couple of decades and that has gotten to the point where the, the financial and legal and institutional structures that were designed to manage risk no longer work. And that shift happens much faster than the climate change. Right? The climate shift has been very gradual over you know, my lifetime in California. But the change in the ability of the system to manage the risks created by that gradually shifting climate is very fast. And I would argue it has more to do with markets than with laws. Um, but certainly, it's the interaction. I, it's the interaction of the two. We'll go with two more here. Um, two more questions. I want to come at this from exactly the opposite direction of the last question. I think you're the solution rather than the problem. Uh, you said that the fundamental responsibility of the CEO uh, is risk management of company killing risks. By that standard, the United States of America is in catastrophic failure at the moment. In 2016, however, in the Democratic primaries, in all of the Democratic primary debates, there were only two mentions of climate change which went beyond saying it's real. What are the chances of 2020 addressing this seriously and what are what role can institutions like your own uh, play in trying to get this up in the visibility uh, to the point at which one could possibly hope for political action that would change the legal system, put the incentives where they need to be, and to put steel in the ground where steel can't wait? So uh, that's a great question. I think. Um, you're right, you know, climate is a low priority, it's, it's, it's the 10th priority. It's on the list, but it's way down the list from other what are perceived as more pressing concerns. What I think the story from California illustrates really nicely is that the way that climate impacts will be felt is that they will not be felt until it is too late. Um, because the real costs will come from when markets decide that a particular kind of asset is no longer investable, right? And whether that is an investor-owned utility stock or a home in the Sierra Nevada or commercial real estate in downtown Miami, right? The decision that the markets are going to make is very fast, and it's, it's more like it's herd behavior. And that's when you feel the climate impact. In California, um, I think the, con the fires have really changed the conversation on climate change in, in important ways. You know, it's, it's a very different thing to walk out into the, I mean, at this point, if you live in Northern California in the fall when it's hot and windy, you feel a little nervous. You look at the sky to see if it's smoky, you know, and, and people didn't used to do that. Um, and everyone has tasted the campfire that lives in Northern California. And everyone has had smoke days where their kids' school was canceled because of the air quality impacts from the campfire and from the Napa fires. So I think, you know, things are changing. How that becomes a national conversation is much more challenging because not everyone has experienced that. And not everyone sees that problem as a climate change problem. You could, it's very possible to see the problem that we're experiencing now as the cumulative impacts of poor land use planning or as a failure of management by a company that can't get its act together. Um, and it's all of those things. Um, it's not just a climate change problem. How you change the conversation nationally is kind of above my pay grade, or, or maybe it's not what I do um, communications-wise. But I think you know, we are seeing the conversation change. 
and what Josh mentioned at the beginning of the talk, you know, that the political dynamics in Washington are very interesting right now. And, you know, one of the things I would note is that it's all of a sudden respectable to say that radical action or make, make very radical proposals um, with respect to what one might do to address this problem. It doesn't mean we actually do those things as a nation, but we might, if we did half of those things, that would be an enormous change for the better and would be a catalyst for action at the international level, I think. Um, so I guess this is a very basic question, but I'm looking at it like you started the whole presentation, you know, with this interesting thing that how people are getting affected, but probably even the solution will eventually affect the people because maybe regulations are in place and, you know, uh, these companies have to be uh, more um, careful about how they use their resources. But even if regulations come in, they probably need to pay amount, uh, insurance is involved, all that will eventually be extracted from the consumer, right? Elec electricity charges are going to go up. So I know you said that you're working separately on it, but I'm just thinking eventually the consumer is getting hurt, right? Like if their houses are not getting burnt, they are, they are paying more bills. So, I mean, is there even a solution to this whole thing? Well, um, this actually goes back to that, the, the comment I just made about the markets shifting very quickly, right? I, I, you know, I think what another thing that this shows is that when we feel, when we actually experience, as opposed to, you know, there's this fun conversation in California about sea level rise. And it's kind of like everyone goes to the planning meeting and they're like, oh no, sea level's going to rise in 2100. Let's plan. And then they keep permitting houses right on the beach as they're doing that because the, real, the, the property taxes are so lucrative for the local governments. And that's like fun climate change adaptation. This is real climate change adaptation and it is super expensive. And there are large distributional impacts to what happens. You know, one thing I didn't mention, but it's really important to understand about these fires, is they, they totally magnify inequality in the areas where they happen, right? The high-income people own a home. They have good homeowner's insurance. That package includes in rental coverage for when your house burns down. So as soon as their house burns down, they go out and they can go bid up the price of rental housing. That means that all the low-income people who are renting and kind of, you know, barely squeaking by get evicted from their housing as the rents skyrocket. And it's California, so there's like a 2% vacancy rate anyway. So those people can't live in the community anymore. They're completely priced out. And then they end up commuting you know, from enormous distances, if they can, to wherever their employment is. And their kids are displaced. So climate change is going to be really expensive. And, and I think an attention to the distributional impacts is going to be really important. But I don't have nice things to say there. I mean, I think this is a great illustration of why kind of equilibrium modeling of these sorts of impacts is not the right way to think about it. And we need to think about kind of step changes in risk perception and how that will filter through and who can adapt because they're rich and who can't because they're poor. And we see that in California right now. Okay, I think we'll end on that non-general equilibrium note. distributional note. Thank you, Michael.